Facial eczema is a thief, and despite the name, it isn't a skin disease, so you don't always see it. Facial eczema is actually a misleading name for a really dangerous liver disease, a disease that costs New Zealand dairy farmers around $100 million every year in lost production. Even low-level, subclinical, invisible facial eczema could be costing you almost one kilo of milk solids per cow per week. And severe facial eczema costs more like two kilos of milk solids per cow per week, as well as having to dry off up to 60 days early for multiple seasons. There is no cure for it, so prevention is the only way to protect animals, and the best protection is zinc. Most New Zealand cows are not getting the right amount of zinc to reduce the risk of liver damage. The good news is, now we have a way to identify if your herd is not getting enough zinc. Now you can test your zinc levels easily and accurately with Zinc Check by FarmSource. We use your bulk milk sample to test for zinc levels and report back to you so you can optimize your herd's defenses. Easy, automatic, and it only costs $99 and your first test is free. Get your zinc level tested before facial eczema tests it for real. Contact your FarmSource technical sales rep or visit farmsource.co.nz slash zincheck to arrange your check today. Well, kia ora and welcome to our Farm Source Seasonal Focus live Q&A session on one of New Zealand's most challenging ruminant animal diseases, facial eczema. The disease is one of the most misunderstood and most underdiagnosed. So well done on joining us live to participate in today's discussion with our expert guests so that you can stay ahead of the curve on this nasty animal health challenge, particularly with this very wet weather and of course humidity together is where those spores thrive. Facial eczema is a dangerous liver disease causing pain and stress to cows and a significant drop in production which can force you to dry off up to 60 days earlier. Just think of that loss of milk production. The disease is hard to detect as by the time you've seen the physical symptoms, sometimes uh, obviously on their face, it's hard, it's too late, it's su subclinical. That's why it is happening and making damage within your herd already having impact well before you will see signs of it physically on the outside of the cow. Today we're going to be talking about spore measurement, facial expert impacts, how to manage amidst the wet weather and of course Zinc Check which was introduced in 2022. As a Fonterra supplier the exclusive management tool to, is available to you to monitor your herd's zinc levels. This is all we're going to learn about in the next uh, half an hour to an hour in this live stream and it's your chance if you're listening in to ask those questions of our expert guests. But if you're also listening back to this on podcast on demand, great work for keeping yourself up to date. We appreciate you are all very busy people so again Thank you for joining and it's a reminder that this session will also be available as a video later this week. Please add your questions in the message uh, board which is known as the chat function and the questions in the questions where you can upvote them and I'll keep an eye on that questions to get them to your guests. If you're monitoring your spore count out there let me know in the chat where your spore count is currently sitting around the country. It would be really interesting to get a feel for that. I'm your host today, Sarah Perriam Lamp, and for this session, it's now time to introduce our two guests today, joining us from Farm Source in Hamilton. Uh, we can cross over to them sitting there. We have the wonderful veterinarian and head of EpiVets, Emma Cuttins. Hi, Emma. Hi. Now, I'm just double checking, you can hear me. In my, is my audio clear uh, at your end? Totally. Fantastic. And to the right there is Farm Source Project Manager on Farm um, R&D, Paul Jamieson. Hi, Paul. Hi. How's it going? Wonderful. It looks like quite the nice studio set there. What's the weather doing in Hamilton? Is it still wet? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's stopped. That's what it does oh. now, isn't it? Uh, and, and our thoughts go out to those who are watching and have been affected by the weather. It's really horrendous. And so uh, just to start there on that one. All righty. Facial eczema, uh, Emma and Paul, uh, a live and breathe this topic. We have got some great resources on the Farm Source website, but today is an interactive live Q&A. Emma, let's actually start, and, and uh, for those who are not familiar about the disease, and your research into it. 
Right, that's that's quite a big question. Um, so are you you're thinking about just understanding how the disease works? Yeah, I think so. As we said, there are that subclinical approach, which is really scary. Cool. So for starters, we all call it facial eczema, and I've been on these talks before where we've said straight away, absolutely ridiculous name, because it is not anything to do with the face, really, or eczema. The whole thing is about having liver damage, and that liver is damaged from the cows ingesting spores from a fungus that grows on the dead and dying matter in the grass. So it produces the spores when the weather is nice and warm and humid. The cows eat those spores, and the toxin that sits within those ends up causing liver damage to the animals. Um, now, that does a, a number of things, right? Because the liver has quite an important role to play in so many things, right? So I like to think of the liver as a processing plant. So when you have cows that are eating protein and fats, the liver's job is to break them down, make them up, and send them where they need to go, right? So if you've got fats coming in, okay, that needs to go into milk fat. Over here, yes, okay, you're going to go into building muscle. But what it also does is it's a waste disposal plant. So when the animals eat stuff that their body needs to get rid of, such as the breakdown products of grass, then it's designed to get rid of that through things called bile ducts, right? So when we have a damaged liver from eating the toxin of these spores, you get not only do you affect the whole processing plant of their food, fats, proteins, they also can't get rid of really nasty stuff from the breakdown products of grass. That builds up. And in some cows, and I really want to stress here that it's only a very small minority of cows, it will cause some photosensitivity where you get, you know, swollen skin or cracked udders or things like that. But most of the time, you don't see that. And you see it in production loss. And that's probably where your question comes in about the research. And we've spent, as a business, 10 years plus every year researching stuff to do with eczema. But one of the more recent things that we did was trying to understand how much production loss there is when they're getting damaged livers. And it was really quite astounding. So I think it was across the season when they're getting the damage, it was a bit over 0.1 milk solids a cow per day. Now bearing in mind that that's an average, you know, across all cows, some of them have more liver damage than others. But the effect is really more pronounced the more liver damage that they have. So if they get lots of liver damage, they lose way more production. Um, and that's typically how most farmers will see it in terms of that sort of loss. Mm. Oh, and, and as you just said there, you know, it's that loss in production that, of course, Fonterra and Farm Source are so crucial on making sure they can support our farmers through 60 days, Paul is a huge amount of an effect to draw off that much earlier. Um, I mean, the, the how long has uh, Farm Source been working on the zinc check tool and working closely with Emma on the space of making it even more easier to, to detect? Well, I came into the uh, business about seven years ago and uh, at that time I brought in the uh, facial eczema program of work for the on-farm team. So you will be working with Emma for about seven years developing um, diagnostic tools, or the, the whole point of the program is to try and develop diagnostic tools for our farmers to use to help them better manage their facial eczema. Um, we're trying to move people from an intuition-based management system to a more of an information-based management system. And the only way to do that is to provide um, cheap, rapid uh, diagnostic tools so that they've got the information that they can actually act on. Um, so many, so much of the research has shown that um, while people are providing zinc in what they think is the right um, amount to the animals, it's not necessarily getting into the animal and providing them the um, risk mitigation that they're expecting to get. So there is a bit of a disconnect between what's being presented to the animal and what the animal is actually um, receiving and providing some sort of risk mitigation. So by developing zinc check and we've got some other diagnostic tools coming, uh, we're hoping to be able to show farmers that what they're doing um, isn't actually achieving what they're hoping to achieve, so that they can then modify what they're doing to actually achieve what they think they're doing, and therefore increase their production, 
uh, so that you know everyone wins at that point. I mean, by back of the envelope calculations, we're probably somewhere in the scene between five and thirty-five million kgs of milk solids lost each year just due to uh, facial eczema um, drop in production. Wow. That's huge. So therefore, it's incredible uh, to focus very cleverly on all the management tools. And and we said there in the introduction about telling us your spore counts around the country. If you ha- uh, know what yours are, please put them in the uh, questions uh, on, on the screen. But Emma, why is it important that we are really focusing on spore count as well as, of course, if we're doing uh, sufficient zinc dosing, how much of a proportion is where those spore counts are in our grazing management um, a part of this? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And I, I guess the key comes to the overarching, um, I guess, sentiment when managing facial eczema, which is you've got to base decisions on information. Like I've spent so much of my career looking at why management programs break down, why if you were giving zinc, did you end up with a whole bunch of cows with fascia eczema, right? And he was like, what am I doing wrong? It's because you were guessing, right? And so the first step to move away from guessing is to know when to start and stop, right? Now, if I was to line up all the reasons why things go wrong with fascia eczema management, this would be the number one because people start too late and they stop too early because they are guessing what is happening with the score count. So, what we've done was spent a ridiculous number of hours for counting and doing score counting research. And the general gist is that score counting is super variable, right? So, so someone else's farm is nothing like your farm. The entire the, the entire microenvironment of the pasture is totally different. So, so the score count on someone else's place or a place down the road or that regional count is not your farm, it doesn't count. So the only way that you can really know whether to start your management program is to be score counting on that property. That's absolutely step number one. And you don't stop your management program until your score counts are consistently low on your farm. Honestly, if there was anything that I could say that said, you've got to take this away, it's start making things on, making your decisions based on information. That's information number one is the need to know when to start and stop. Yeah, a couple of qu- <laughs> couple of questions there. Um, when is, I mean, obviously you can keep a level on, um, you know, moisture levels and humidity levels and things like that. Or is it just a, hey, you know, come mid-January, start of Feb is when we start counting. How, how do you suggest you start that process? At what point is it? Because obviously our summers are very variable now. Yeah, it's such a good question, right? So back uh, back when they originally started doing research, they even looked at whether you can start predicting based on weather patterns. You know, if, if I have humidity here and rainfall here, can I predict spore count? And you can't because the if you think about what a spore needs, because it needs dead matter and it needs humidity and it needs moisture, that's all hugely variable within that very small microclimate under the grass, right? So... So it's very hard to guess. But what I would say is spores and facial eczema is a disease of the weather. It's not a disease of January or February, right? So if you're getting uh, weather that you think, gee, this is pretty wet and humid in November, Mm. well, that's when you've got to start. Now, people that are often a lot of veterinary clinics around the place will be doing various regional counts. And they're quite good for just knowing if there are spores. So if they're starting, I've been encouraging veterinary clinics to start in November because that's that's how early it's starting these days. If you get those and you get the text or what, however you get told and they say, yep, we've got some spore counts in the area, that's when you say, right, it's time for me to look at my own farm, right? And then you do your own farm, you do it weekly, four paddocks every week until you start moving up with a trend and when your spore counts start moving up, there you go, you start your zinc. Now, that doesn't matter if that's December. Maybe that's not until March because it doesn't actually matter what month we're in. The only thing that matters is the weather, right? You don't have to spore count when you start your zinc program or whatever program you're doing, but you do then have to pick it up at the end before you make decisions. So so that's typically how I do it. Either look at the weather or your regional counts. If you don't have regional counts as early as places like November, then you're going to have to get stuck in and do it yourself. Or 
give your regional vet clinics a poke to say, can you do some regional counts type thing? Yeah, but but that, that's essentially how you're doing it. Don't base it on a date. And actually, to carry on on that, some of the um, information we found uh, during our research is actually showing that we are seeing liver damage occurring uh, right into um, May. Mm. You know, and we're sort of second and third <laughs> weeks of May before we're seeing liver damage coming into some of these herds. So the the period where we have a problem is actually starting to expand with you know climate change and all the rest of it. So it is very much you need to, as Emma said, monitor what's happening on your farm and continue that monitoring right through probably longer than what you think it is. Because you know, a lot of people drying off in early May and if you're not, you can still be hit by facial eczema over that period and damage the cows even more. A hundred percent. I I remember presenting in Bay of Plenty a couple of years ago, it was something like the 20th of November, small counts were already at 30,000. I then presented somewhere else coincidentally in June and they still had 20,000 counts where it was. So, so I mean, and then there will be other years where you get hardly anything. It's, it's totally dependent on the season. Mm. We are going to have a full hour because we've got some fantastic questions coming in from our audience. Please keep them coming and I will get to them uh, in between some of my questions because I'm just naturally very curious in this, particularly this topic. I find it really fascinating as well, so definitely. But I just wanted to highlight um, Joe Grigg is watching. Uh, hi, Joe. Two weeks ago in South Marlborough, extensive hill country, 55,000. Is that of concern? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, and... The number itself sure is a concern. I think when you start stretching above 30,000, most people see that as a concern. But what concerns me more is the trends, right? So we know that very newly produced spores are the most toxic, right? So if you get, if you're on a farm and you've got <clears throat> 10,000, 10,000, 20,000, I'm not too worried about that. But if you went from 10 to 50 in a week, I'm starting to worry about that. Right, because you're starting to, you are starting to expand on those spores very, very fast. Um, so yes, great question. Yes, I'm concerned about fifty-five thousand. And um, Joe is actually a sheep and beef farmer, and so therefore um, we are obviously in a farm source um, podcast. But it's just around uh, diagnostic tools in the sheep and beef. I just do want to actually put that out there as she has asked that question. Um, obviously, we're here talking about zinc check, which is a milk test. Uh, product that's offered through Fonterra but yeah I mean it's just really monitoring those spores making sure you're dosing for zinc and those types of things would be advice there yeah so it, I mean the concepts are just the same right so you want to monitor your spores so you know when to start whatever management program you're doing in the sheep and beef world to be honest most of it is done with um, zinc capsules or bullets um, so then you can you put those in, and now once you get to the end of those bullets, you know some of them are four weeks, some of them are six weeks. That's when you'd start say, okay, do I need to put in another one? Let's have a look at what our score counts are doing again. So it's it's the same thing. You're still basing on information. The one main difference from the dairy scene is that if you are using bullets, I probably wouldn't blood test um, because. With both of the bullets, one of them, the blood test isn't a good indication of whether it's working, and the other one, they're so darn consistent that you probably don't need to anyway. That's the that's the main difference with the dairy scene is that you're still basing it on small counts and information, but your management tool suggests you don't need to check the zinc quite the same as in the dairy scene. Mm. With the proviso, got a good understanding of the weight of your animals and are using the appropriate boluses oh, yeah. for the appropriate weight and size of your animals. We're going to get into um, zinc, <laughs> zinc management very shortly. I just want to sort of round out a bit more on pasture management. I've got a great question here f um, from Zach Brown. Cool name, Zach. Uh, there's a band, <laughs> Zach Brown band. Um, ha have shelter belts. Is the spore only in dead grass or dead matter in general, like dead leaves from trees and in, in around shelter belts? That's such a good question. It'll, the, the fungus will grow on anything that's dead. Right, so you can, you can like, so for example, when clover is growing, it doesn't tend to sit on, it doesn't tend to grow on clover that's growing, you know, because it sits up high and it doesn't have any dead matter clover. But I tell you what it does is when you, when the clover is dead and you grow it then on a bed of clover, wow, does it grow? So, so yes, generally speaking, it can grow on any dead matter. 
Leaf litter, I'm not as sure about, but I have no doubt that when the leaf litter sort of breaks down into little bits and you end up with a lot more, you know, that sort of stuff down in the base, then I'd say it probably could. Now, shelter belts are a known risk. So not only because of the shelter, so they don't get hit by the wind the same, but probably like you've observed already that, that yeah, you get a build-up of heat Um just staying on there and a question and there's some great advice on the farm source website around pasture management but um you know if we're leaving longer covers and long uh, and um longer rounds and also as we move uh into having you know more diverse pastures and, and wanting to have more soil cover particularly through to resilience of the summer period we're going to get a lot more density in that sward um so therefore what what's going to be um, the element there, particularly is this moving down through the South Island now too. Um, you know, what's the, the ideal length for grazing down to? You know, I don't think you could say an ideal length because it's not it's not really, there's two issues, right? So you've got the build-up of the dead matter at the base, so that's a problem. But you've also got how low they're eating, right? So Although the spores do move, they, they do sit up higher. The majority of the spores still sit lower down at the base. So if you've got longer grass with potentially more dead matter, but you're not eating down very low and you're only sort of nipping off the tops, then your risk is not necessarily that much higher. So um, it's one of those incredibly impossible things to ask. I think uh, grazing management and good pasture management to avoid lots of dead matter is always going to be a general principle that you want to apply. Um, but as to what the length and, and stuff, I wouldn't have an absolute clue because um, it really just depends on how you've managed it leading up to it and how much dead, you know, rubbish you've got at the base. Yeah. On that note, we are actually um, looking at doing, at, we have some research programs, looking at uh, diverse parts is, you know, um, opening up the sward a bit with plantain or chicory or what have you um, and <coughs> trying to uh, understand what effect that has on the spool count. You know, so obviously least, less dead matter base will should by rights drop the amount of spores, which drop the amount of um, habitat for the fungus. Um, so we're trying to see is there a optimal sward mix that we can actually um, recommend to help maintain lower dead leaf matter at the bottom. So that's very early stages at the moment. Mm. Um. Just in Taranaki area, looking at turnips as um, with farm source the last couple of weeks as well. Is there any research going into in terms of that mixed diet and and anything in terms of their resilience um, for health, ultimate health of balance of protein and, and things like that, Paul as well. Uh, not specifically in terms of preventing facial eczema or. Um, Increasing the robustness to facial eczema, no. But um, obviously, healthier animals have a much better tolerance to uh, any disease. Um, and there is a there is a little bit of a uh, lack of knowledge around acute versus chronic exposure to the um, spores and the amount of toxin. Um, so again, healthier animals are going to be much better at hopefully. Um, getting over low level dosing of, of toxin um, without hopefully significant liver damage. Mm. Uh, to those questions around um, zinc dosing and things, we're going to get into that uh, very shortly. Just wanting to round out on, on pasture management. Martin is saying that they're regeneratively farming and have heavy grass, multi-species cover all year round. Does this make them less or more likely to have issues with facial eczema? Uh, we always have cover and moisture. I, I hopefully that kind of answered it a little bit. Is there anything more to add on that? No, I'd say that aren't you well set up to have a look yeah. yeah. So um, the short answer is I don't know. The multi-species thing probably helps, but the longer cover probably doesn't. So I'd probably start doing a bunch of spore counting on your property and see what you're finding throughout the year. And um, and then and then let me know. So when someone asks me next year, I'll be totally owning that question. Feel yeah. free to send us the data. <laughs> yeah. We're happy to analyse yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, for participating in our research project. Um, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, unwillingly, but still. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Hey, um, just a question here about uh, the impact of flooding and drought and the differences in spore count. 
that's really tricky. Um, but if you look on if you look on first principles, I guess like uh, if you're going to end up with moist dead grass, you're going to end up with excess spores, right? So the the flooding's not going to suddenly get rid of the fungus. The fungus is there all year round. It's just sitting there waiting for the right conditions, right? So, okay, when the grass is underwater, you're probably not going to have much of an extra problem on that particular part. But when that goes away, you've got dead grass mm. that's really wet. Yeah. <laughs> so so you probably do. Now, drought's different again, right? So we get that all the time, um, and you don't tend to get quite the same moisture that gives you the extra that you need when you're in the middle of a drought because you've got A, no grass, and B, it's as dry as a bone, right? But what I would say is that some of the biggest risk periods that we've seen have mm. come just after a drought, right? So you think you're in April and you're all good and it finally rains and holy heck, then we go because now you've got an entire paddock of dead grass that suddenly started growing once the rain comes and then you've got heaps of extra. So so quite often that's why you'll find places that are uh, suffering from a drought over, let's say, February, March or so, you don't get a lot of eczema then, because uh, it's you know, too dry, but holy heck, you get it later on. So um, they, they both have effects. Uh, from memory, if anyone's listening from Southland to clarify this, I have a funny feeling that happened last year. Um, there was a, a shower come through after it um, had been a very dry summer and there was a bit of concern down there. But if someone could clarify to, that to me in the chat, that'd be great. Um, Paul, let's get on to zinc check. How does it work? Uh, so what, how zinc check works is that we take a milk sample from the bulk milk uh, and we analyse that for the level of zinc in there. Um, we've done three, four years worth of um, research um, to correlate the level of zinc in the animals within the herd to the um, average level of zinc in the milk. And we can show that, um, we can tell if at least 70% of the herd have a serum level of zinc that provides um, optimal risk mitigation against facial eczema. So, if you, when you get your results, it is broken into a red, a green, and a, and a purple area. Um, in the red, we, and again, it's a sliding scale. It's not binary. So as you move from the left to the right, you're having a greater proportion of your herd with some level of protection. So if you're just sitting just outside the green, um, it is possible that you've got 60, 66%, uh, 69% of your herd is um, got protection, um, so you probably okay. If you're right down on the left hand side and you're sitting in the, in the red, there is the highest probability that almost none of your animals have reached a, a protective level. And at the other end, uh, when you go into the purple, it is indicative that um, at least 10% or more of your herd has some le uh, has toxic levels of um, zinc. So again, you need to review what you're doing. And in all of these cases, what we recommend is that you go and talk to your vet and you review how you're um, pre presenting your zinc to your animals. Um, whether that's you know, double checking the weight of your animals, uh, if you're using an in-shed in -shed, uh, uh, feeder, um, just take a weight and make sure that when you think you're providing 2 kgs, it is actually providing 2 kgs. If you're using mixer wagons, making sure that it's mixed properly, making sure that all your calculations are correct. It's just the basic things because what we've found through the research is a lot of people um, do all the calculations one year and maybe five or six years later they haven't actually revisited any of those and small changes creep in over these times, um, the way your cows change, the number of cows, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so suddenly what you think you're doing is not necessarily what you are doing. So we always recommend that first off, double check that all your calculations and everything else are as correct as they can be. And then go and talk to your vet, get an animal health professional involved. They can come in, they can help you um, go through your, your system and see what's going on there. And, you know, do bloods. Mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, if you're um, not trusting what the um, zinc text is telling you, do bloods. And quite honestly, I'm always happy to look at the bloods and help to improve zinc text going forward as well. Um, so please contact us, have a chat, um, and we can help with your vet. Um, talking about what's going on and helping you interpret some of those results. Yeah. But yeah. So the first one's free for all Fonterra um, 
suppliers, uh, and then it's uh, basically $99 per um, result from that point forward. Um, last year, I'll admit, we uh, were taking a little bit longer to get results back. Uh, this year, we've uh, modified that and talked with the laboratory, and we are getting results out significantly faster. So hopefully, um, everyone can see that and then receiving the results. As we said there, yeah, Zingcheck was launched last year after extensive research poll and you've had um, a season of experience under you about commercially seeing it rolled out on farms. How did farmers find it and what sort of things have you learnt to continuously improve Zingcheck? Well, obviously the turnaround time uh, was one of the big things. Um, when we released the product, we envisioned that people would utilise it um, prior to the being season kicking off, as it were, uh, and what we found was that a lot of people were using it in response to an increased <laughs> score count. So, um, using it probably a little bit closer to the time than uh, preventative, um, we got a lot of feedback. In fact, we found that about eighty percent of all pe of all the people utilising zinc were not providing significant zinc su sufficient zinc to the herd to provide. Um, some sort of risk mitigation. And that backs up with all the research we've done as well, uh, floods, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out that, and that's why we've been harping on about going back and double checking your um, calculations and everything else, is that uh, for a lot of a lot of farms, what they think they're doing is not what's actually occurring. So again, like I said, 80% were in the red. Uh, we did have about 3% of farms up in the toxic level. Um, and they got contacted and hopefully dealt with that very quickly. Um, we had reasonably good response from vets. They were um, quite supportive of it, um, very keen for us to see it. And again, it's about everyone feeling that we're moving towards an information-based um, response rather than that intuition-based response. You know, the old story of, of taking a sock full of zinc and sticking it in my um, trough and I don't see any facial eczema, therefore everything's okay. Um, hopefully we can move away from um, that kind of thinking. Um, and honestly, the, the, the group of farmers that utilised more than one test, we moved from having 80% of them in the red to having, um, I think we got down to 60% of them in the red. And then by the time they got to a third test, it was about... Um, 30% of them were in the red. So we significantly moved um, all of those farmers that had more than one test up to, um, towards the green um, in a much better way. So it does work if you um, look at the test, take the information and then make some active changes, make some uh, be ready your calculations, you will move towards the green and then for, have the best chance of providing your herd with as much risk mitigation as possible. Mm. Um, thank you, Paul. There's a, there's a lot in there, and I can sense there's a lot of people watching going, tell me how to make sure I've got enough zinc, and we'll get to that very soon, as well as a lot of your questions. Um, but as a vet, Emma, how do you like zinc check and in your conversations with other vets, vet to vet, about zinc check? Cool. Um, honestly, it's, it's, part of it is like, I know that we're considered biased because we did a lot of the research behind it, but in terms of leaps forward for facial extra management, this is the biggest leap forward I think that there has ever been. And the reason for that is because if you look at what everybody is doing now, Know that he's checking their zinc, right? Now, you can do it at the moment with blood testing. Blood testing is very good. It is very accurate. Uh, but no one's doing it, right? So now we've got somewhere where we can say, all right, you can come in for free and see if your management program is working. Like, and, and I think that um, that there is, wow, what an amazing leap forward that we can make for you guys to finally see if what you're doing has a chance of working. Because at the moment, everyone's guessing, right? Everyone's saying, hey, but I'm putting it in the troughs and I'm drenching and so it must be working. Newsflash, it's not most of the time. And this is allowing you to finally see that. So so that's certainly what I would say to farmers. So the vets, what, one of the challenges that we have with any sort of testing is that, you know, every test has a degree of inaccuracy to it. Um, and, 
and you know when you're taking a, a whole bunch of cows and taking a bunch of bulk milk you know you're gonna have variations in it because you're grouping all the cows together um so i guess from the point of view of the vet is let's take this use the clinical mouse that you've got sitting behind it to say does this actually fit with this farm picture and by all means get in and take bloods if you need to back up what you're seeing on the bulk milk test right but in generally speaking if you're at either end if you're at toxic or if you're at red you know odds are that's probably pretty darn accurate um, so, and that's where most people are sitting, to be honest. But if, if you're in the green, that's a little bit more challenging. There can be a little bit more inaccuracy when you're in the green, which I know is counterintuitive, right? Because you're like, I'm in the green, so I'm totally fine. But you can you can be in the green with half of them deficient and half of them toxic, right? Because we're dealing with a bulk milk mm. result. So what I would suggest is that if, if you're in the green, I would look at some bloods as well to be like, okay, what sort of picture have I got in my herd? Have I got a whole bunch of cows at either end? Or, you know, have I actually got a really nice spread that sits in with my, with my bulk milk? No matter what you're doing, though, as long as you're making your decisions on some information, you're streaks ahead of where we have been for the past 100 years. And so, so ideally, for the visualisation, um, you've got on the left-hand side, you've got the red, which is under deficient in... Um, in, in zinc and in the middle is your green your sweet spot where you're, you're perfectly covered and then your purple that you're referring to on the fast point of the scale is an excessive amount of zinc in the system so I'm going to now get to some of these questions uh, around I just, I just need I just need to correct you for one oh, thing because yep. I can't it's like, so if you're in the green I know I, I wouldn't make the suggestion that you're perfectly covered okay. right? so if you look at how the analysis was done we were always comparing it to whether 70% or more of the herd had enough zinc in the blood, right? So when we measure zinc to say, do we have enough to protect against facial eczema? We're looking for that blood zinc to sit at 20 or above. I think that was, it was the value that we're looking at. Normally, zinc sits somewhere between sort of nine and 18, right? That's what a normal cow would look like. So even if you were in the green, you could still have a number of cows that weren't there that we didn't quite make it into having enough zinc. And that's really normal, right? To try and get 100% of cows with enough zinc in their bloodstream, you've got to shove that stuff down till it's almost toxic, right? So, so I think that it's just worthwhile getting your head around the fact that Managing facial eczema well is not necessarily always going to be 100% of the cows having enough zinc 100% of the time. It's almost impossible to achieve. The green suggests that, hey, you're probably doing pretty well. I would probably still check it, but you're probably doing pretty well. Um, but I wouldn't focus on saying, hey, 100% of my cows are sweet 100% of the time. Cool. That's a fantastic clarification. Thank you. Again, it's a bulk milk. That's right. Yeah, and That's right. You're, you're taking the average of the herd at, at the thing. So what was what, what it's effectively saying is that at the end of the day, you're doing for all of your your current process for your herd at a herd level is being as optimal as it can be without going through and going each individual cow, mm. blood testing them and then giving them a specific dose to make sure that each of them gets there, which let's face it, no one's going to do that. That's just insane. So from that point of view, we're looking at from at a herd level on the balance of probability, your herd is as covered as it's potentially able to be. Yeah, fantastic. Let's get to some of these questions about uh, uh, what is the best way to make zinc palatable to stock? Is there flavoured zinc or does flavour need to be added? That's such a good question. Zinc tastes awful, and that's not because I've tasted it, but every time I present anywhere, someone always puts their hand up and tells me how they've tasted their trough, and how it was awful. So yeah, zinc does taste, or in particular things like zinc pepper, which goes into trough, that tastes, that tastes awful. There's no flavoured zinc, but you know what? I think there should be um, flavoured, and you know, yeah, absolutely. So um, what you can do, I guess the only thing you can do is if you're putting it in the trough is to use some of those flavourings that you can buy. You can buy grapple or caramello. Oh, that smells so good. Um, or sometimes the aniseed, you can put some aniseed stuff in there. Um, 
anecdotally, farmers always tell me that it makes a massive difference. I think it makes the farmers happy because it smells so nice in the shed and near the troughs. Um, as to whether they drink more or not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anything you can do to get them to, to eat more or drink more if you're having issues is, is the way to go. Yeah, and uh, Zach's also put that there about putting zinc through the water. He's noticed his cow's licking the water, not drinking it because of the taste. Uh, yeah. So hopefully, yeah, and you see like the, the zinc sheen across the top, and you're like, yeah, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd go there either. Yeah. Now, as a general rule, I mean, I'm not trying to do a spoiler alert here, but generally speaking, water is really crap in terms of a method of getting zinc into them. I. I've done hundreds of zinc investigations and I've seen water work once. Um, so it's a real shame because I know that half the country do it, but if, you, if you're giving it in the water and you do your zinc check, yay, odds are you'll be in the red. Um, it is very, very difficult to get enough zinc into them by the water for that exact reason that what you've noticed is that they don't like it. Yeah, our research data would suggest that um, there was no difference between uh, providing zinc and water and doing nothing. Um, so yeah, again, it doesn't mean it can't work, it just means that on on most in most cases, it's not being uh, utilized as well as it potentially could be. So um, probably better to look at an alternative means of getting the um, zinc into the water. Yeah, and we'll get into that in a sec. Denise has um, got a, a, a message here. We have a cross section of cattle, beef from uh, sorry, beef which are our own weaners and seventeen month and dairy grazers. We normally have an inline zinc system, which is the case will be unsuitable due to the dairy cows having zinc bullets this season. What would you recommend for our own stock? As the inline would be unsuitable for the dairy heifers. I am thinking the Peter system for our own beef. How reliable is the Peter system? Um, you know what I'd do? I'd bullet them. I don't mean like bullet bullet. I mean like, I mean like you know, zinc Simple. capsule them, zinc bullet them. Um, uh, Peter dispensers, in some respects, I, I think uh, can be better than in line because it's you know because it's in the trough and you don't have the same issues with water leaks and evaporation. But it is almost impossible to get enough into them via the water in any way, whether that's Peter or in line. So if you've got the capacity to bullet your beef animals and wiener animals, that's the way I would go, honestly. Awesome. Okay, so therefore it's all about capturing to get the most practical way into, uh, as Michelle said, her dry cows. Um, and so all stock, basically, you believe in capturing. If, if you can't get it in another method, like so, if I had to choose, and I, I realise there's an expense to this, and there's also a, well, Emma, you, you're going to say to capture all my herd, how about you come and do it, right? I realise it sucks, I get it. Um, but if you're choosing the right method to control lexfam, you're choosing between water and a capsule, I'd choose capsule every single time because we know for certain that they're very, very consistent if you give it before the spore counts rise and if you give it to the right weight. Um, the only other way to look into is starting to do things like zinc in the feed, which generally speaking can be better than water. Um, but if you've not got that option, you've got water, you've got capsules, go capsules. Um, it, is, it is worth every expense that you put into it based on what you will lose if they get extra. Because we haven't gone into it with beef animals or dry stock animals because we've talked about milk production. But holy heck do those things lose weight when they start getting liver damage. So it's, it's, it's honestly, it's worth every dollar. So therefore, Paul, when you were saying that the farmers aren't using it as you sort of had intended, I hear what you're saying. I think it's a great idea to do it at the start. So you've got a baseline so you can see um, if they're moving back or forward right at the start when those spore counts start to um, climb. But then when it comes to your farmers that you said were moving uh, as they were doing more tests, what were the way that of application that was the most effective to move? Unfortunately, we uh, didn't gather that data from uh, the commercial um, farms. So, in from anecdotal information, uh, they moved from water to, to feed. Um, in some cases, it was as simple as weighing their in feed sheet. Uh, in feed sheet. Oh. <laughs> In shed yeah. feeding <laughs> systems. Oh, um, and, you know, in some cases, as I said, they thought they were delivering two kgs 
their system was delivering one and a half pages. Um, and it, until they actually went and weighed it and went through all their steps, they, they didn't know, they weren't aware of it. Um, we heard other anecdotal um, reports of there was two farm workers, one thought it was the guy in the morning's job, the other got, he thought it was the guy in the afternoon's job and neither of them were doing it, um, that kind of thing. So it's just, you know, uh, greater or lesser, a lot of it's quite basic stuff, just double checking that the systems you have in place are actually working and are doing what you think they're doing. So and that would, again, that it, from from the information that was gathered last year, that becomes our primary source or primary um, recommendation is to just go back through your your system currently and review it and make sure it's still going as you think it's going, doing what you think it's supposed to be doing. And if that's still not working, then we, you can bring in a vet. Because I mean, obviously reviewing it yourself is a lot quicker and cheaper than getting somebody in on phone. Where did the 2kg uh, metric come from? Is that based on uh, a metric of how much to dose daily based on their weight? Because obviously everybody's got mixed different herds sizes as well. Yeah, it, that was just an arbitrary number that okay. they were using at that time. Uh, that's not a recommendation of how much you should feed and shed or anything else. It yep. was just they thought they were supplying X kgs, yep. in this case it was two, and they were half a kg shy. So it's you know if you're putting four kgs or whatever it happens to be through your feeding system, just double check that what you think you're giving is actually what's being presented to those animals. Oh, and get the feed sent away. That's always fun. Oh, yeah. Make sure there's actually zinc in it. Yeah. 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 So, so we had another, so, another so, case where a farmer was feeding and they thought there was zinc in the feed. There was no zinc in the feed. And then we had another one where they were drenching and feeding and they said, do not put zinc in the feed and the company put zinc in the feed and so suddenly they went to a toxic level. So, you know, there's various things like that as well that you need to potentially double check should that suspicion be um, raised. Yeah, well, so that so that is at what point that the zinc would be added. It would be blended f- for your... Um at your at, at, at supplier level, um, but therefore, yeah. what's the hard one is that you know what I've heard from doing um, a lot of these chats with you with you both in the past is that you know it, it, it's just so hard to get enough zinc into them, but then there's that other fear to balance around that toxicity level. But say for instance, you had the opposite with those two guys that you mentioned there, where both thought it was their job, so they were getting a double dose. Um, is it? Is it quite easy to get to a level of toxicity or is it something to not fear too badly, Emma? If you're looking at a law of odds, odds are you're not giving enough, right? Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes you do get the situation where too much. And it's usually a situation of in the feed. That's generally where you most where you tend to see it the most, whether whether that's a feed company calculation error or a person error, or you generally see it in the feed. Um, uh, I haven't really seen it very many other other ways. So I think it's worth watching out for. But again, that's why basing your decisions based on information will highlight that really early on. And we had that situation um, in one of our trial herds actually um, over in the Taranaki, and they were part of they were. It was really early in the season, and we picked up that it was toxic. My goodness, thank God that we did, because they were wickedly toxic. Um, it took weeks, actually, to get the zinc back down, um, and they were just falling over themselves thankful that they had actually been part of that trial, because they would have come really unstuck if, if they hadn't. So, so, yes, it happens, but I wouldn't get too hung up on it, because the odds are that you're going to have the opposite, which is that then you're not given enough. Yeah, and that's the message I probably wanted to clarify is don't hold back or fear of toxicity um, because, yeah, like you said, a majority of the time you'll be well under and deficient in it um, anyway. Hey, um, I've had a... Everything, just one caveat to that is yep. is saying, uh, you get, I get a lot of people saying, can I give feed and water? Can I give these two methods? Can I give, can I give a smaller capsule and water? So in that situation, I would say... I, I wouldn't say don't hold back. I would say, Jeepers, if you're going to do anything a little bit out of the box like that, 
you better check it. Um, mm. And that's that's sort of a theme the whole way through. And that yes, most of the time you're going to be low, but you start meddling with different methods like that, then that's when you start going to be at a higher risk. You start putting capsules and water together. Oh, okay. That's you. You'd better start checking that. And yeah. can can I actually say ninety nine dollars for a test in terms of the outcome of success and or the cost of getting it wrong is bugger all. So why not? It's right there. It's a tool that we, you can constantly keep using. Completely. I mean, if you have a significant uh, staffing change or you decide you, know, you have any sort of significant change on the farm that could impact your dosing, I would recommend redoing your zinc check. Um, if we're assuming that once you've got it to a steady state, that there's not a significant change in how you're doing things. But you change batch of, of feed, say feed is your main way. If you you change your batch of feed, it's probably worth spending the extra $99 just to double check that the feed's still going in and I'm still maintaining that level of zinc that's still there. You know, suddenly you have a major rain event um, and you're dosing in water, it's probably a good, good chance just to double check that if you were in the green with your water system, that you're still in there and that there hasn't been a significant change in the amount of water that the animal's consuming due to the fact that we've had, well, that they're swimming. But, um, yeah. Um, Linda, I have literally been on the tip of my tongue uh, about to ask the question that you were prompting me to, to make sure I don't forget to ask. But I just wanted to cover off because the uh, on actually the application of zinc because it's such an important part to get right. Um, so to that point, it, there's a few people wanting to know around pasture spraying for spores and your thoughts around that does it kill the spores as well as alicia wants to know how much damage it does to the uh you know microbial activity in the soil that are healthy and helping the plants as well yeah those, those are good questions i'm probably better at the first part than i would be at the second part so um the the things that are in those fungicide sprays. They're quite old technology. They were they were um, the fire benzoles, they were I think something like that. They um, they were yeah, they were designed in the sixties and seventies. It's still the same stuff, right? So uh, and yes they are pretty harsh to the environment with earthworms and, and things like that. I don't know enough about the soil health side of it. Um, I'd love to know more, but there hasn't been the work done. But what I can tell you is this, it is not designed to kill spores. It is designed to stop the fungus from growing on the pasture, right? So if you put it on pasture that, let's say, has a 500,000 spore count, it will decrease the spores a little bit. The research is showing that, yes, there'll be some reduction, potentially 40 50% of spores, uh, and then it's designed to stop the fungus from growing. But by then, okay, you've gone from 500 to 250,000 spores you're still going to get eczema. So the key thing about a fungicide is that you've got to know your spore counts before you put it on, right? So you cannot put it on high spore count pasture and expect it to work. You'll still get animals with eczema because it's not designed to get rid of the spore. So you've got to be monitoring your spore counts, and when those spore counts start shifting, maybe you're going 10,000, maybe you're going 20,000, that's when you put it on, right? Put it on when the spore counts are low. The second part of using fungicides is that the pasture needs to be green and growing. So much the same as when you're spraying like with Roundup or uh, any of those weed sprays, you know, like on your grass, it has to be green and growing because it takes it up into the plant. Now, fun fact, which is probably a little bit too much fun facts for this type of thing, but you can actually get a fungicide coverage of a plant by having the roots soaking in the fungicide because it's designed to be absorbed into the plant and then have its extended activity. Now we're doing it by spraying it on so it absorbs it through the leaf and gets into the plant. You can do it by the roots but that's just a fun fact for that's not practical at all. Um, so that's the thing right so it's got to be green and growing so if you've got drought pasture you're in the Waikato and that pasture's all brown don't use a fungicide because it's not going to work. And then the final point for fungicides is that you've got to now go and physically go under your trees and hedges. So if you're using a helicopter, you've still got to get your boom out on your quad bike and get under the trees and hedges because otherwise you will still end up with eczema. Mm. Does it make it any less palatable, that fungicide? I don't know, but I've certainly never heard any anecdotal stories to suggest that it is less palatable. 
Yeah, awesome. Hey, great questions, guys. Um, uh, I've just got another one here from Fraser about how long does a zinc present in the animal after it's been consumed? Yeah, great question. Only a very short amount of time, 18, 24 hours. So it's very much a daily thing. You know, it's not like, you know when we give copper, mm. how copper builds up and it stores in the liver and, you know, that's, that's why we do liver testing and stuff like that. doesn't happen with zinc. Zinc is very much a daily thing, so it's an everyday thing. The only reason why certain people get away with sort of every second day uh, treatment is because they give them so much that it takes ages to take ages to decrease. But generally speaking, a daily thing. Okay, uh, last few minutes for some questions. If you do have any more burning, um, please put them through on the questions or the chat. I'm checking both of them. But uh, Paul, I understand there's a new milk test coming next year. Uh, yeah, we've been working with um, LIC to develop uh, a way of looking for liver damage utilising the bulk milk sample. So using a, a biomarker that is generated when the liver is damaged, it passes through into the milk and we can determine whether you are heard as some level of liver damage or a well, or definitely some level of liver damage uh, at this point. Um, so we're trying to do some pre-commercialization this year. Um, the idea would be to monitor a herd over a 10-week period so that you can understand what the changes in the liver damage status is. Um, and then hopefully you can react to that or you can um, move forward with it. The, I the original idea was to uh, get that onto our mid career instrumentation so that you've got uh, a daily uh, piece of information that comes out. Uh, we are working on that. It's been a little bit less successful, so we're using the reference method at the moment. Um, and hopefully, we were trying. We wanted to provide this information to those to, to everybody, um, and hopefully, highlight to those people that just because you're not seeing uh, clinical signs doesn't mean that your herd doesn't not necessarily not having facial excrement damage. So, in other words, you're getting some liver damage, but you're not seeing any clinical signs. So whatever management tool you're utilising possibly needs to be reviewed um, and optimised a little bit more, whether that's utilising zinc check to show that your zinc is correct or other tools that you like. But you know, actually, try, again, it's trying to convince people to go and have a look and gather this information so they know what's going on. Um, I mean, currently you could go and do um, bloods, do PGT, but that's very expensive um, to try and do that once a week or with a significant number of animals in your herd that makes it actually usable, you know, doing five animals in a herd of 500, uh, when, you know, it's an individual animal that will have liver damage, it's not necessarily um, represent five animals, not necessarily it's also representative of the herd. So, yeah, that becomes a bit Again, this case, we move into a bulk milk sample so that we should be able to see, on average, whether the herd has suffered some level of liver damage or not. So yeah, if you are interested in um, being part of a pre-commercialization trial, uh, please yeah, contact us uh, properly through the, the website or whatever. Um, and actually, fe at um, fonterra.com is our um, email address. So please just put me an email at actually fe at fonterra.com and um, I'll get back in touch with you and I can help um, discuss being part of a pre-commercialization trial on this. Awesome. Martin, did you get that? Just in case. <laughs> um, he was suggesting the IC that Kirsty's typing a question, but I also have one from Michelle here. Can you put other minerals in the trough at the same time as zinc is going in? You can, um, and a lot of people do. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, but if you can, if you can get the zinc out of the trough, <laughs> to be honest, um, and keep the other minerals in, that's fine. What I would just caution about is, is copper. Um, it's really tricky balancing up copper because you don't want them to have copper deficiency, just as much as you don't want them to have extra. But if you put in a lot of free copper, and by free copper I mean like the copper sulfates and the copper max injection or palm kernel or whatever, you tend to have an angrier toxin. And I haven't explained why, I probably won't go into this, but that the toxin, the toxin itself is undergoing a reaction in the rumen, essentially. That's that's how it does its damage. 
and the copper makes that reaction worse and it speeds it up. So copper is definitely a problem when you're giving it with zinc. So um, so I'm not saying not necessarily not to give it. I just I just caution how many things you're putting in the in the top. And also, can I just use this as an opportunity that we, on the 16th of February, have another one of these live streams that is purely all around dosing methods as well. We could probably go into a bit more detail then. Um, Emma, Alicia has picked up on that too around copper deficient areas in the country where animals are supplemented with injection or capsule. Does this need to be timed around um, eczema risk periods? So, so you were sort of alluding to that then. Uh, is there anything yeah, oh, with copper and stuff? You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, like, um, it, you know, the same story with copper. To be honest, is exactly the same as zinc. The vast majority of people give it, and I have no idea if they're supposed to give it. Right? They just do it because that's what they've always done, and nobody liver biopsies, which is really what you need to do for copper. Um, you know, there's no point doing bloods unless you think they're really deficient. So most people are giving this copper because someone told them to, or somebody drove up their drive and said that their cows would produce way more if they, you know, if they have this much copper. And they probably don't even need it half the time, but if they do need it, well, working in with your vet on the timing is going to be pretty crucial. Are you? Can you get away with giving in your copper earlier than the facial eczema season, or? Is there a way that we can do um, a mineral mix that might have things a bit more protein bound, which is a bit safer? There's all these different options that your vet is totally trained to be able to talk with you with. So um, that's what I would consider first. Do you need it? Because you're tested. Um, and second of all, um, the timing is really dependent on your need and how deficient they are and how much, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, nice. And again, please join us on the 16th of February and we'll go into some more detail uh, there as well as um, I have a burning question um, that I'm going to save <laughs> because I can keep talking about this for another hour, but we're not. We're going to ra wrap that up. Kirsty, thank you very much for your lovely message. Just wanted to say thanks. Very informative living in the South Island. This has not traditionally been seen as an issue, but weather patterns are changing and it's important for us to be informed and test. So thank you so much, Emma and Paul. You guys are incredible in the work that you do in this space. Effie at Fonterra.com. Now you've got a hotline to pull, so <laughs> um, make sure you, you reach out to them if you want to participate also in the research which would be great fun particularly to get advice specific to your farm though uh, make sure you reach out to your farm source TSR uh, or in store uh, talk to the manager around some of the products and also the, the right application for your farm as Emma said your vet is also an incredible source of support around this and having a, a team approach is a great way to have advisory and make sure that you are staying ahead of the curve when it comes to this horrible subclinical disease that you don't can't see the symptoms of before you have a problem. And utilising zinc check is an incredible way. Yes, it is of a, at a herd level, but hey, the more information you've got, the better we can manage these situations. And you don't want to be getting into that point of drying off because of disease. So therefore, make sure that you are treating this with such great importance. And it's fantastic to see the team at Fonterra investing in uh, technology, their partnership there with Liver Check with LIC. It's fantastic. And as Emma said, this has been uh, a a long time in the making with a lot of clinical research around it. Uh, yes, there's continuous improvements to be made as well, so therefore reach out and uh, let's get on top of this scary problem because we can't do much about a changing climate. Hopefully we've been able to answer a lot of your questions in detail. Please do reach out to the team if there is more that you need and of course as I said there on the 16th of February we're going to talk more about zinc dosing and get an update on where we are at within the season. The 16th of February will be a really good dipstick around where spore counts are out at. So if you join us again, please bring with us your local spore count levels. We want to have a, a good discussion around what's going on around the country then. To register, head to the website and uh, of course check your inbox as we'll be emailing out the link to that uh, later on this afternoon and share if this has been helpful with your friends or your team. As I said, it'll be available on demand uh, later on in this week, as well as on the Farm Source Seasonal Focus podcast, which I can highly recommend as a great toolbox of information, not just on facial eczema, but also uh, right across the spectrum of advice that Farm Source offers. In the meantime, have a wonderful day wherever you are around the country and uh, stay dry if you can. Thank you very much for your time.